I'm Matt CMG, and you're watching Disney Channel. Pim, can we watch something else? It's, it's, it's about to get really good. It's about to get really good. Yo, who the f ba -ba is Matt CMG? Hey, Paisanos, it's a me, Matt CMG, and today, let's talk about TV. Nowadays, when people think of the concept of watching TV, they picture sitting down on their couch, pointing their remote at their smart TV, and hitting the Netflix button. But back in my day, we had this little thing called cable. Like the, like the Marvel character, cable, but like, not really. Shouts out Marvel's Capcom 2, that shit was poggers. I'm gonna take you for a ride. I'm gonna take you for a ride. For the fetuses in the audience born pre-9-11, before streaming was a thing, cable was how we used to watch all of our favorite shows. There were dedicated channels, each with a particular group of programs, that channel had a number, and that was pretty much the only control you had over what you watched back in the day. Now add in having siblings and, and parents that wanted to watch different things with a shared TV, it, it was a fucking mess back then. While today's model of streaming whatever you want whenever you want is overall much better for the consumer, I still have a bit of a soft spot for the ways of old. Today I wanted to go over some of the things that I think gave cable TV its charm and why I low-key kind of miss it a little bit. So smash that motherfucking like button or I will end you where you stand! And let's get into it. So I think the first thing to address here is that, given the nature of how live TV used to work, how the fuck would you even know when your favorite shows were on or where to find them? Nowadays, we just Google that shit or just look it up on Netflix or whatever streaming service you happen to be on and see if it's there. But that shit didn't fly back then. I'm, I'm making myself be much older than I really am, but like, Jesus Christ. The solution to these problems at a time before the internet came in the form of TV guides, which in and of themselves came in many different shapes and forms. The most primitive of these, which admittedly are before my time, came in the form of physical lists that you could go out and buy in stores. These types of TV listings can be traced all the way back to the 1940s in the United States and even earlier than that in some other countries, which according to Wikipedia is, is the case, but that doesn't really make any sense because I'm pretty sure TV didn't exist then, but sure, yeah, maybe it's radio, maybe they're talking about radio, that probably makes sense. Shouts out radio. But the most recognizable of these could be found in magazines throughout the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s. As the name suggests, these would literally just list out what TV shows would be on, on what channels, and when, usually consisting of the next, like, two weeks or so of programming. Again, these were a bit before my time, so I never really have any experience with them, and they aren't really that interesting. But now let's get, let's get real, real nostalgic, real fucking, uh, whoa, top 10 things from your childhood that were actually a little bit dark. Uh -huh. Gaming. I'm gonna stab myself in the brain with a fucking knife. At some point during the late 2000s, around when there was a huge shift into HD, yeah. TV guides began to be phased out and started to be built into a lot of cable boxes. Did I like mention that? Did I mention like to have cable back in the day? You need to like have a physical box. You don't really need that shit anymore. You used to not need that, and then you needed it, and now you don't need it anymore. It's fucking bizarre. Anyways, each cable provider had a different aesthetic to it, but the basic premise was that you could view channels and what programming was on them without actually having to change the channel, and as time went on, some cable providers allowed you to set reminders for when your favorite shows would be on, and you could even DVR them without the TV even being on. I was a Comcast kid, so I always think back to that old blue and yellow interface from back in the day. I remember it took them like two or three years to add the fucking like picture in the corner so you could still watch your show while surfing channels. That was a fucking godsend back then, bro. Eventually, Comcast changed their UI to have this, like, you know, more modernized vibe to it with, like, the picture darkened in the background. It's, it's fucking heinous and disgusting. I definitely much prefer this shit. Occasionally, when you go out to, like, restaurants and shit, you'll see this, like, old interface somehow. I don't know how that fucking works, but you'll see it occasionally, and it's like, ah, that's goaded. I know it's definitely just the fact that this was the kind of thing that I grew up with, but there's just something so charming about the primitive nature of these things. I used to love just scrolling- Coda, are you fucking kidding me? I used to love just scrolling through these and seeing what would be on all of these different channels, and even scrolling like weeks ahead of time just to see what my favorite shows would be on next. But what's also really interesting to me about these early HD interfaces is that many cable providers also offered video on demand content, which was kind of crazy at a time before streaming. Again, I was a Comcast kid, so I remember going to that Comcast on demand channel all the time and being blown away at the amount of content that was at my disposal. Of course, there was the ability to rent movies for real money that a lot of video rental stores used to do back back in the day, and we definitely did that on a few occasions, but most of the stuff on these VOD services were completely free. Did anybody else's parents do that thing where if we, you like rented a movie, you had to like watch it every single day to like get your money's worth, or were we just fucking like crazy people? Am I a crazy person? Am I autistic? I think I'm autistic. That's probably that. My point is, Comcast On Demand was a kid's wet dream with how much free shit was on there. Like, honestly, I didn't even watch half the shit. I used to just have fun scrolling through all the different categories and seeing what was available while the fucking 24-7 ads played in the corner. Apparently, this service even had exclusivity 
street deals back in the day. For example, I remember the iCarly I Go to Japan special was available on this service long before it aired on TV. For the longest time, I used to think that I was special and that I was like the first person to see this because I like fucking hacked the mainframe and was able to see it before everybody else. But uh, apparently everybody else saw it early too. Uh, thanks, thanks uh, doing research for this video. You fucking ruined my childhood, you cunt. Like, I remember, I remember having fun with this at my friend's houses too, where we'd find like the strangest free movies on there and it was, it was always a blast. Have you guys ever seen Soldier Boys? I guarantee you you haven't, but that shit was on there and it was fucking low-key kind of heat. At the end of the day, these primitive VOD services were certainly ahead of their time, though their dark side is that they also kind of paved the way for modern streaming. It was also kind of weird because sometimes they'd have like specific like on-demand branding, like you're watching Nickelodeon on demand, but then other times they would just literally be like somebody recorded their screen and like just pulled the whole thing with commercials and everything. It was, it was very bizarre. The best part of them though was that you sometimes had the ability to skip through commercials, which was fucking goaded. It made you felt like a god. Of course, commercial breaks kind of came with the territory when it comes to TV. You know, nowadays ads are obviously still a thing. You might even be seeing one right now. But ads most certainly exist in a different way today than they did even five years ago. I did a whole dedicated video a while back where I talked about this in more detail, but the short of it is that there was just a certain charm to old commercials that doesn't really exist anymore, and that's due in large part to the entertainment landscape shifting away from the previous TV model. Commercials back in the day were a lot more fun, and ad campaigns had a lot more creative leeway, while modern ads are a lot more sanitized and are often made to be as short and inoffensive as humanly possible, while also simultaneously being as intrusive as humanly possible. And I don't think that it's a nostalgia thing either, since the fact that we can now pay extra money to get rid of commercials or block ads online completely is what makes them seem like much more of an annoyance than they really are. Commercials were still annoying back in the day, but you know that you at least found something to like about them. Nowadays, it's like, oh fuck, I gotta sit through this fucking Liberty Mutual ad again. I'd rather kill myself. But enough of that tangent, let's get back to our regularly scheduled programming. See what I did there? It's all oh, a little topical, thematic fucking meme. I'm gonna kill a in a fucking car crash. What are we doing? But obviously, not everybody was fortunate enough to have these cable packages where they could DVR their shows or watch them on the demand the next day. So what do you do when you miss your show? Well, there used to be this little thing called reruns. This is something that obviously still happens because obviously cable TV still exists even though it's on fucking life support, but has less of a reason to exist because of streaming. You know, it's kind of impossible to miss an episode these days since all streaming services save your spot for you. And if you want to see an episode again, you could always just rewind. But before we had that power, we had had to wait for that shit to come on again, which was never a guarantee. As time went on and more shows began to be made and the TV industry became more lucrative, there eventually became a point where channels would become so specific in their content that they would basically just rerun three or four shows over and over again, and this is how we get syndication. Pretty much every channel did this to some degree, just to pad out their daytime slots, and some channels were even dedicated to just rerunning old episodes. So it wasn't uncommon for you to see the same episode multiple times, especially if it was just something you had on in the background or something like that. The fondest example that I can remember was TBS, where they had the syndication rights to Family Guy, American Dad, and The Big Bang Theory, and became notorious for airing a Christmas story 24 hours on loop every single Christmas. I'm low-key kind of ashamed to admit this, but I watched a lot of reruns of The Big Bang Theory when I was a kid, and I have seen that first couple seasons multiple times as a result. This might be a bit of a blasphemous statement to some of you, but I will die on the hill that the first couple seasons of The Big Bang Theory are actually not, like, terrible. They're actually kind of decent, but I digress. To general audiences, there isn't much of an incentive to watch things multiple times. You know, most people just watch a show once and then forget about it, so I think the fact that all of my favorite channels were constantly rerunning old episodes that I had already seen made me appreciate those shows a lot more. You know, I, I don't think that I would have liked shows like Avatar or Regular Show or Family Guy or any other show that I watched a lot as a kid had they not been replayed all the fucking time. On the opposite end of that spectrum, though, there were also the things that were very rarely or even never re-aired. For one reason or another, some programs would air once or twice and then just never again. One of the most iconic of these was Crybaby Lane a Nickelodeon original movie that aired one time in the year 2000, but due to its content frightening the youth at the time, was never aired again. And it was considered lost media for 11 years before Nickelodeon decided to air it again as a marketing ploy. While to a much lesser degree, this was also the case for a lot of other Nickelodeon original movies, where they'd premiere once, get a few repeat airings across the week, and are promptly forgotten about. They did a lot of these during the 2010s, with stuff like Best Player, Swindle, and even the Fred movies, the first of which is actually Kino, and I will die on this hill. Nikki Deuce? I never actually watched any of these movies back in the day, but I remember seeing ads for them and then never actually seeing the movies, you know what I mean? Disney Channel treated their original movies a little bit better, though, where they even had specific branding for when that shit was coming on. Now, I was never much of a Disney Channel kid, but even I get a little bit excited when I hear, let's watch a Disney Channel movie, and you got kids doing, like, fucking karate kicks and shit. 
<laughs> you know what I mean? I don't know how the fuck I did that without ripping my balls in half. Oh my god. On the Cartoon Network side of things, one of the rarely aired programs that I remember was The Thumb Series, which was a series of shorts that parodied popular movies like Star Wars and Titanic, but with every character being a thumb. Thumb people from Spy Kids 2, real. These would air on rare occasion over the years where they'd, you know, they'd air once and then air like again for no reason like a year or two later. They'd basically re-air as soon as you've forgotten about them, you know what I mean? Apparently they're still making thumb specials, like one of them, one of, there was one that came out in 2023, that's fucking crazy to me. That's, that's, I don't know how I feel about that. My point here is that over or under exposure to certain shows have a very similar effect on how you view them. You know, you, you might grow to like a certain show because they happened to air it a lot, and you might also be intrigued by that thing that aired once or twice and then disappeared. You know, I, I loved a lot of the shows that they would just rerun constantly, but I would also find myself disappointed that they weren't airing like the last day of summer more often. You know what I mean? Scarcity like this isn't really a thing anymore because now we have the ability to choose what we watch, and most new things that come out happen to be archived when back in the day, it was kind of all up to the networks. P crackers these days have Netflix and chill. Back in my day, we had TV and PP. You know what I'm talking about? I'm a virgin, by the way. In that other video that I mentioned a bit earlier, I also talked about how specific children's channels had their own specific branding, but this also leads me to something that has completely died in the modern streaming landscape, programming blocks. Back in the day, channels would often have specific blocks of time dedicated to airing specific types of programming. You know, these would range from simple things like new episode premieres, blocks for foreign programming, themes nights where they'd rerun old episodes under a common theme, and of course, Saturday morning cartoons. I talked about some of these in the other video, like Cartoon Network's You Are Here and Har Har Thursdays, but let's go over a few more, shall we? Just for, just for shits and giggles, just for funsies. During the 2010s, Cartoon Network had an early morning block called DC Nation, where they would air new episodes of a lot of DC comic shows, alongside shorts made specifically for the block. I have some pretty fond memories of catching new episodes of Young Justice back when that show was still good, and so many of the shorts introduced me and a ton of other kids to some of the more obscure DC characters like Animal Man or Amethyst Princess of Gemworld. That shit, that shit is locked in my head, bro. Fucking Animal Man! He's like, gay. Hey. On the other side, Nickelodeon would often have themed nights centered around a particular topic. One of these that I distinctly remember was the Heat Wave event, where in June of 2010, Nick featured a one-night-only block featuring all of, all of their live-action shows, with each episode dealing with a heat wave, which aired during the week of an actual heat wave across the U.S. And I have to mention this out of obligation, but there was also a very Victoria Friday night, where they'd aired a block of a bunch of their different shows, with every episode having my girl Victoria Justice as a guest star. What's up, girl? I'm trying to get you to guest star in my life, you know what I'm talking about. Moving on to a more adult channel, Fox had the animation domination block, where they would air shows like Family Guy, The Simpsons, King of the Hill, and a bunch of other adult cartoons. Similarly to Nick's Heat Wave event, in 2011, they had the Night of the Hurricane, where they premiered new episodes of Family Guy, American Dad, and The Cleveland Show, with plots all centered around the same hurricane, because those shows all take place in the same universe. Of course, you can't forget about Toonami, which was almost solely responsible for introducing millions of <coughs> kids to anime. And manga! And gay man. There are a ton of different videos out there detailing the history of Toonami and how it brought about this current age of otakus, but the fact that it's still around today is pretty telling for how iconic it is. Smoking filtered crack, you stupid piece of shit. What a crazy old man. New episodes of Dracula Flow are airing weekends at 11 p.m. Only on Toonami. You know, there were Cartoon Cartoon Fridays, Disney Afternoons, Nick at Night, but I think we all understand the concept of a Saturday morning cartoon. What started as a way for toy companies to advertise their toys in the 80s became a tradition that would be adopted by almost every single kids channel out there, and even some non-kids channels for that matter. You know, Kids WB and Fox Kids had all kinds of kids programming in the morning before getting onto the regular daytime stuff. Saturday morning cartoons were great because it gave kids something to be excited about on Saturday mornings, and, you know, the literal, 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 littler, little, 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 what am I, what am I fucking, what am I fucking gay? 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 What are we doing? Saturday morning cartoons were great because it gave gave kids something to be excited about on Saturday mornings, and for the literal littler kids out there, they were usually up pretty early anyways, so it kind of gave, it was a great way to start off your weekends as, as a little, as a little infant, you know what I mean? Unfortunately though, Saturday morning cartoons began to die out as the internet became more popular. You know, there was no reason for kids to wake up early to watch this stuff anymore, since they would just catch these episodes on their iPads or whatever the fuck, so they would slowly be phased out, with the final Saturday morning cartoon block being the CW Vortex, which aired for the final time in 2014. You guys want to know how autistic I am? I, w I remember like, in 2013, I turned on the CW Vortex a few times. I kind of like made a bit of an effort to watch it, not necessarily getting up early, but like every, if I was up early, I would like, you know, I'd be like, oh, I gotta watch the CW Vortex. I gotta watch Saturday morning cartoons because they aren't around anymore. And I kind of missed out on that when I was younger. 
And uh, yeah, uh, that was very autistic of me. <laughs> that was way too late to be doing this. You know what I mean? Like I was, I would have preferred my dad walk in on me watching porn than me watching Sonic X at fucking 10 a.m. on a Saturday. You know, yeah. <laughs> I think the most important thing to note about not just programming blocks, but the old nature of TV in general, was that it kind of forced people to watch things that they wouldn't otherwise have watched, you know? While these programming blocks were obviously designed to promote brand synergy, they were also typically separated by genre, you know, with action shows one night, comedies on another, live action in a third, and it just made finding new shows that you might like a lot easier. You know, nowadays when people recommend me a show, I'm thinking to myself, yeah, I'm not gonna fucking watch that. And anything that I do watch is usually my own choice after having debated it in my head for three fucking months. But back in the pre-streaming days, we didn't always have much of a choice. You know, sometimes you'll just be waiting for your show to come on, so you'll just watch whatever was on before while you wait. Sometimes you'll be watching a show that you like, and a different show will come on afterwards that you'll leave on out of curiosity. Sometimes you'll just have the TV on in the background while you do other stuff without any real regard to what was actually playing. You know, sometimes you were just stuck between Nickelodeon and Disney Channel and two shows you'd never heard of, so you just pick a channel and see where it leads you. There were so many shows that I discovered exactly like this, right? Where it was just the only thing on that day, so I kind of had no other choice, and oftentimes I ended up really liking those things. You know, I, I don't think that I ever would have watched something like Generator Rex if it wasn't aired right next to Ben 10 and Clone Wars. I probably wouldn't have cared about shows like iCarly if they weren't played all the fucking time. There were far too many Christmas and Halloween specials that would air yearly on these networks, alongside whatever other random one-off bullshit they would air, that if it dropped today, would be completely no lost and forgotten about. And don't lie to me either, right? Don't tell me you would have watched Scary Godmother or all of the other reindeer if they weren't aired every fucking year, right? Don't bullshit me, right? Fuck you. So, that has been a brief look at the nature of cable TV from when I was a kid, which in fairness was not that long ago. And while I do romanticize it a bit because of nostalgia, I will also be the first to admit that things are a lot better now. Streaming makes it much easier to get into shows new and old, there's no commercials if you pay for it, it's impossible to miss episodes, and you can watch things as many times as you want. It's definitely much better now. Or is it? See, something that I haven't really touched on thus far is that cable packages kinda sucked dick. There was basic cable that had all of your standard channels, but if you wanted extra channels, some of which had exclusive programming, you had to buy the specific cable package that had that channel, and oftentimes you were paying so much extra for a million channels, and only one or two of which you actually used for one or two shows that you wanted to watch. You know, if you wanted Nicktoons Network like I did as a kid, then you had to pay a bunch extra for a bunch of fucking channels that you never actually used just for that one channel. I mean, I wasn't the one that fucking paid for it, but I imagine it was fucking expensive, you know? Nowadays, things are kind of the same. When streaming first began, it was just Netflix and Hulu and maybe a few random other ones, both of which had programming from all over the fucking place. But then these big corporations came in and saw how profitable streaming was, so they decided to make their own streaming platforms, which is how we get stuff like Disney Plus and HBO Max and all these other fucking streaming services that nobody gives a fuck about. All of which with their own exclusive shows and very little crossover between them. You know, if you wanted to watch The Mandalorian, you gotta pay for Disney Plus. If you wanted to watch Adventure Time, you gotta pay for HBO Max. We've reverted back to the pre-streaming days where you had to buy extra shit just to watch one specific thing. You know, the, the more things change, the more they stay the same, I guess, you know? Everything is just so spread out these days that it's honestly fucking bullshit, which is why I go straight to piracy these days, and I would honestly argue that you are morally in the right for doing so. You know, it, it's probably cheaper to buy a NAS and a VPN and torrent everything than it is to pay these big, greedy corporations your hard-earned money. But even though the TV industry has always been backwards as fuck, I don't think that it'd ever take a away from the memories that I have of watching cable as a kid. You know, obvi it obviously wasn't always the best thing out there, right? You know, we were always at the mercy of the networks and all of the negatives that I've brought up throughout this video. But at the same time, I'll kind of miss some of the positives. I'll kind of miss the thrill of discovering old shows by accident through programming blocks. You know, I I'll, I'll miss the branding and identifiers and shit like that. I'll miss the forced commercial breaks, marathons, primitive on-demand services, TV guides, and above all, I will miss the excitement of gathering around the TV for a new episode premiere. I I cannot remember the last time that I was genuinely excited to see a new episode of a TV show the same way that I was as a kid, and I think it's honestly because the old nature of TV made these things feel like an event, whereas now it's just kind of, you know, sitting in your computer for 20 to 40 minutes with no real buildup, you know? There was just a different energy back then that's kind of impossible to replicate, and I will always be thankful for that particular brand of nostalgia, and for being one of the last generations to truly experience TV as it was. Thanks, corporate America. I want to fucking die. But that is all for this video. If you were born pre-9-11, and let me know in the comments some of your favorite TV moments. You know, like the video, comment, subscribe, Patreon, all that shit. I've been Matt CMG, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. The stars of four kids will sing the national anthem. I -O -D
digital cable Watch a lot of channels yeah. whenever you're able HD is free, let me put it on the table For twenty nine ninety five. you can design the label Let's get some pussy tonight.